So folks, welcome. Just for the movie, this is um, December 3rd, and there's two handouts for you guys. We have a handout for our final unit on immunology. And folks, my hope is, is that we'll get through, um, before our lecture exam three, a week from today on Tuesday, I'm hoping we'll, we'll be able to get through all of the nonspecific innate defenses. Um, but you guys, since we will only then have one lecture to do uh, adaptive acquired specific immunity, we might not hit all the topics in the study guide for that second part of um, immunology. So we will only have um, questions on the final exam, um, questions on topics that we cover in lecture. So I just don't want you to panic to think that, oh my god, there's no way that we're going to be able to get through all of this. And then, you guys, the, the second handout is a, a really neat article um, on how the um, over, over cleanliness of our environment might actually contribute to some of the immune disorders that we see today, like um, hypersensitivity, autoimmune diseases. So again, um, this article, you guys, is just for your interest right now. If I, if I will ask you anything on the final exam, I'll make sure that I announce it in um, lecture or I'll post it on Canvas. And it would probably end up being bonus questions, okay? All right. And then, folks, just one, one, another little tidbit on uh, our lecture exam three, which is, again, next Tuesday, you guys, it'll start at the very end of microbial genetics. It will start with horizontal gene transfer, a little bit on plasmids, a little bit on transposons, a little bit on antibiotic resistance. And then it goes into viruses, prions, medical micro. And again, um, it will also include the information on um, innate nonspecific defenses, which we'll talk about today and on um, Thursday. Um, if you'll see on Canvas, you guys, there's this great TED Talk. Um, and it's entitled, How Sewage Saved My Husband's Life from a Superbug. Now, I was having trouble getting the link there. But if you just type in that title, and again, it's posted on Canvas, it's a really fascinating talk on how bacteriophage isolated from sewage was able to successfully treat a multiple antibiotic resistant bacterium that was killing this, this, um, this um, woman's husband. So again, it's just kind of emphasizing the potential for bacteriophage to be used to treat antibiotic resistant bacteria. And that would just be a little um, bonus question on lecture exam three. But it's kind of a cool little study, study break if you guys are interested. Okay. So then, folks, what we're going to do is um, finish up our medical microbiology unit. Last time, we finished the first PowerPoint on virulence factors, you know, what the microbes have to do to be able to invade, colonize, avoid the immune system, and then cause harm. And then, folks, today we're really quickly going to go through the second medical micro PowerPoint, and it's titled um, Epidemiology and Disease Ecology. Right. So this is kind of like things that lead up to the pathogen encountering their new hosts. And it will be rather superficial, you may see. So the first thing we want to remember, and this kind of goes back to the One Health concept that we started our whole course with many weeks ago, and that is the concept of medical ecology. So if we're talking about infectious diseases, there, there's actually three important factors that interact um, to cause infectious disease. So there are host factors, so our age, our immune status, nutritional status, the level of stress, if you've had injuries, all those host factors will contribute to the development of infectious disease. The environment is really important, so climate can be important, um, which vectors are available, which reservoirs are available, um, um, food, whether food is fecal contaminated, for example, if there's lots of untreated sewage around, um, those factors can all contribute to the occurrence of infectious disease. And then, folks, what we've been focusing on in that first PowerPoint was, was the microbe itself, right? We explored different virulence factors that a microbe um, may make or produce that lets it um, cause harm. But we're going to see, you guys, that um, some microbes, which we might normally consider as being beneficial, either um, mutualists or commensals, under um, certain opportunities, they can become opportunistic pathogens, and even members of our normal microbiome can cause us harm. Right? So the three factors that interact, host environment and microbe, interact to cause infectious disease. <coughs> and then another concept, you guys, is symbiosis. So from lab, you remember symbiosis is when two different organisms live together. And we know there's three types of symbiosis based on the outcome, right? Who wins, who loses. 
So folks, what do we call it when both of the symbiotic partners benefit? Mutualism, right? So do we have mutualistic microbes that live in our, in our body? Yeah. yeah, we've got a lot of them, folks. And indeed, many members of our good beneficial microbiome, we're going to discover they're actually part of our innate defenses against um, potentially virulent pathogens, right? They can live in our intestines, as an example, and block attachment sites with potential pathogens. They can compete for nutrients with potential pathogens. They can produce inhibitory products such as acids or, or specific antimicrobial compounds, right? So the microbes, the good microbes living in our intestine, we would consider them good partners. They benefit us, and then we benefit them by supplying a nutrient-rich, warm, moist environment for them to grow. Um, what would you call it, folks, like when we did the... Um, the nasal swabs in lab, and I discovered, once again, I'm carrying Staphylococcus aureus, but at the time I didn't have any obvious infections. The Staph aureus wasn't causing me harm, um, but it wasn't helping me. Um, what, what would we ca call that kind of symbiotic relationship where one partner benefits and the other partner is neither harm nor benefits? Commensalism, right? And you guys, we have a lot of commensals, right, in our body. Like a lot of us do carry Staphylococcus aureus as a commensal. A lot of us carry Staphylococcus pyogenes in our throat as a commensal, right? Right, so again, um, they don't cause us harm, but they don't benefit us. And then, of course, you guys, the symbiotic relationship we're really fascinated with is parasitism. How would you describe parasitism? Oh, yeah, one of the partners benefits, and the other partner, the host, is harmed, right? And so often we think of infectious disease, that's what we're talking about is examples of parasitism. Okay, now um, one thing folks, and I, I didn't put this in here to make you crazy, you don't have to memorize the resident mi microbes living on and within us. But what I did wanna stress you guys, it's really important, is that symbiotic relationships can change, right? And, and you guys know this instinctively. So you guys, what if I took a good E. coli living in my intestine, where it's helping me, being beneficial. And what happens if that same E. coli gets into my bladder? Would I still consider that E. coli a mutualist in my bladder? No, it's causing harm, right? Causing inflammation of the bladder. Um, so it changes from being a mutualist living in one place to being a what in another place? A parasite, right? So you guys, we need to remember this that um, there are instances where our mutualists, our commensals, can take the opportunity to cause disease. And what would we call, what would we call such a pathogen? An opportunistic pathogen, that's right, you guys. So we want to be aware that members of the normal microbiome, um, they may switch their roles and become parasites and actually cause harm, actually cause <coughs> infection or cause disease. So you guys, we want to we want to ask ourselves, well, when might that happen? When might like a good guy, right, or at least a neutral microbe, when could it switch into the role of a parasite? What would be some of the situations? What are some of the opportunities where members of the normal microbiome could cause harm? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Because we take antibiotics, we wipe out the good protective members of the microbiome, and then who survives? Is an example. Candida albicans, right, the yeast, and then they can overgrow and cause an yeast infection, inflammation, pain. Good, you guys. Um, what, what might be another opportunity where members of the normal microbiome might switch to becoming parasites, causing harm? Um, Catherine, yeah. right, 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 good job. Thank you, guys. So whenever microbes get introduced into sites, they normally wouldn't grow, right? So you guys, what if we had an IV catheter and I, it got contaminated with Staph aureus and then I insert the IV catheter? Could the Staph aureus now start growing in my bloodstream potentially, right? Is that, is that harmful? Yeah, that's not good. What about you guys, um, if say um, I'm in the hospital and I have to have surgery so they insert a urinary catheter? Could some of the fecal bacteria, the E. coli, around the, the um, anal area, could it potentially contaminate the tip of the urinary catheter and then get inserted into the bladder where it starts growing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you guys, medical procedures where we're using these inanimate objects, um, often they end up introducing microbes into places they shouldn't be. So whenever we're doing medical procedures, right, we're always worried about that, that we're going to end up um, causing infection of our patients. Good, you guys. What, folks, what if... Um, 
what if I have HIV and I progress to AIDS? Would that be an opportunity for maybe some members of my microbiome to cause serious harm? Right. So what about if I have an autoimmune disease and I'm on immunosuppressive drugs? Would that, would that be an opportunity for maybe members? Yeah. So what if I'm a cancer patient and I'm undergoing chemo and radiation therapy? Would that suppress my normal defenses and permit then some members of my normal microbiome to cause harm? Yeah. Right. Um, if I'm diabetic, right, you have re reduced blood flow, again, you know, that might, that might be an opportunity for members of my normal microbiome that normally wouldn't cause me harm, they might be able to cause harm, right? So you guys remember that those symbiotic relationships, they're very fluid. They can change all the time. Yeah. Great. Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you guys. One more thing because we're going to be talking about this. What if I have, like, a cut or a burn to skin or mucous membranes? Would that be an opportunity for microbes to cause harm that normally wouldn't cause harm? Yeah. So any kind of injury, right? Anything that breaks the skin <coughs> or mucous membranes um, will provide an opportunity for members of the normal microbiome to gain access to places they shouldn't be growing and cause harm. Good job, All right. <coughs> so, folks, you'll recall in the first PowerPoint where we are talking about virulence factors, um, substances, structure that microbes make to uh, attach to us, to colonize us, to evade, avoid the immune system, and then cause harm. We, we call those virulence factors. And, and we had titled that PowerPoint, you guys, how to be a good pathogen, right? Well, what we want to do now is back up a couple of steps and ask, well, what else do you have to be if you're going to be a good pathogen, right? What, what do you have to do before you reach your new host? So what we want to do then is just really briefly, you guys, talk about reservoirs and transmission, right? Um, where's the pathogen living, you know, before it reaches the new host? How does it get to the new host, okay? And folks, on... Um, the medical micro supplemental notes, which are posted on Canvas, you guys, there are some, um, on page three, there's some little brief supplemental notes on reservoirs and transmission. So that might just be a little bit helpful for that. Okay. So you guys, if we're going to be a good pathogen, then, let me see. We have to maintain what's called a reservoir. And if you think of a reservoir of water, folks, it's, it's a supply of water, right? So think of a reservoir of, of pathogens is a source of pathogens. And so, folks, we think of reservoirs as three different types of reservoirs. Can you help me out, you guys? What are the three reservoirs of pathogens? Good. Humans? Okay. Yeah, good. Non-human animals? Uh, Non-human <laughs> Yeah, non-human animals. Oh my gosh, you guys. Okay, we're going to get through this. And what's the last one? Environment. Environment. Good, okay. And folks, um, uh, an important vocabulary term that I think you guys might know already, what do we call um, um, infectious diseases of humans in which there's a non-human animal reservoir? What do we call those? Or some fancy? Zoonoses, good. Yeah, zoonoses. Zoonosis is singular. Zoonoses is plural. And if it was a short answer, guys, I don't care if you use the, the singular or the plural. Okay? Good. So you guys, I think I've got some additional slides so that we'll talk. Just give a few examples of um, these reservoirs. So, so folks, of great interest to um, people that study infectious diseases are zoonoses, for it's believed that in the future, most of our new emerging infectious diseases and, and always these initials, you guys, EIDs, Emerging Infectious Diseases of Humans, it's believed that in the future most of these will be zoonoses. And the reason is, as our population continues to grow, we're invading more and more natural um, habitats, you know, maybe where people normally wouldn't live. And so we're invading those spaces, we're coming into closer and closer contact with animals. And when we come into close contact with animals, <coughs> Pathogens of animals or microbes of animals can jump into humans, right? So just, just a, this is an older example, folks, but uh, we believe the origin of the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, it initially was a, um, what was called a simian immunodeficiency virus, a non-human primate. It was originally like an animal immunodeficiency virus but that humans came in contact, it possibly because 
Um, um, in many parts of the world, monkeys are used as food, right? Just like, like my family would go deer hunting, use a deer as food, right? There's areas where monkeys are used as food. And so it's possible that in the, the butchering process, right, the blood from the monkey with the SIV maybe got through a cut into the blood of the hunter, right? And remember, you know, those doggone RNA viruses with such high mutation rates, right? Eventually that SIV was a, 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 um, able to adapt to humans. And now, you guys, we consider HIV a human pathogen, right? Right? But it, it originated as a, as a zoonotic virus, right? And again, you guys, this is why people are so interested in zoonoses, because it's thought that a lot of the new um, diseases of humans will be, um, at least will start out as zoonoses. Yeah, Crystal. What did you say SIV um, simian, immunodeficiency virus. So this was the ancestor. This was the ancestor of what? Yeah, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. And, and this to you guys without me hopefully going on about it. I mean, part of this is that there's people in the world that don't have enough to eat, right? And so um, th this is something that, I mean, it's kind of a worldwide problem with our population explosion that if people, if people are really hungry, they're going to go, you know, harvest whatever food they can. And, and, and the more pressure we put on the, the wild animals, right, the more contact people have with the wild animals, the greater is the chance that we'll have a, um, an animal micro pathogen jump into the human, and then a lot of we have a brand new infectious disease. So you guys, these are um, the hantavirus, um, plague, and rabies. Um, these are all zoonotic pathogens that we have here in California. Hantavirus can cause a potentially fatal respiratory tract infection. Bubonic plague, we know you guys can, um, can, um, can kill, um, we often, get infected through the bites of fleas that have been on infected, um, maybe small mammals or rodents. That little guy, you guys, is a prairie dog. We don't have it here in California, but prairie dogs are good reservoirs for bubonic plague. Um, Monkeypox, we aren't gonna worry about, you guys. Um, rabies, probably most of you as kids were taught by your parents that if you see like a nighttime animal out in the daytime, like, you know, a bat maybe or a raccoon, and they're acting sick, you're probably taught don't touch it, right? Because it could have rabies. Um, we know that, um, that dogs can, can carry the rabies virus, and if we're bitten by those animals, then we can contract the rabies virus. So rabies is a perfect example of a zoonotic pathogen. And you guys, it was, I probably shouldn't have done this, but I put chronic wasting disease in there in parentheses with a question mark, because chronic wasting disease, the prion disease of deer, elk, and moose, it's not classified as a zoonosis, but would you trust a chronic wasting disease? <laughs> no, right? Would you want to, you know, if you knew an animal had <laughs> chronic wasting disease, would you want to eat it? No. Yeah, gosh, you guys, with the history of mad cow disease in Britain, you know, and everybody saying, oh, you can still eat beef, even if it has a mad cow prion, not a problem, we'll jump to beef. Well, we know how that would turn out, right? So you guys, I just want, you know, I'm just like, maybe, maybe in your lifetime, they'll discover chronic wasting disease is a zoonosis. Yeah, you know, wow, that <coughs> Anyways, this is not to make you panic at all, but it was just to give you an idea of some of the diversity of zoonotic pathogens. And, and many of these we've talked about either in lecture or lab. But again, you guys, you don't have to worry about memorizing it. Okay. Um, oh, and one thing I did want to say, you guys. Um, so we have mentioned, like, with, with, um, with humans, just to give an example, you guys. So, so today, our, our modern HIV um, we would consider humans are the reservoir of HIV because we're not going to get HIV from the soil. We aren't going to get HIV from fecal contaminated food or water. We won't get HIV from an animal, right? We're going to get it from another human being. So that's just an example of a, of a pathogen with a human reservoir. And you guys, um, zoonoses, can you give a couple examples here of zoonoses? Hantavirus, good. Monkeypox, good? Can you think of anything else? Rabies. Rabies, good, good, good. I was just, just to make sure you guys, okay, good, all right. And the environment, you guys, this is what I think of, is that um, the environment, let's say it's soil or water, right? 
I'm thinking this, is ha this has to be a pathogen that is very tough and resistant or has some tough and resistant stage, right? So you guys, I think of like maybe fungal spores. And just think of um, coccidioides imidis, valley fever. How do we get infected? Remember, you guys, from lab, coccidioides imidis, the cause of San Joaquin Valley fever, it grows as a filamentous fungus in soil in nature, living off of dead organic matter, and then it forms spores. And then we <laughs> inhale the spores, you guys, remember? And that's how we get infected with valley fever, right? So the spore is a tough resistance stage, right? We would say the soil is the reservoir, right? The soil is the reservoir, we inhale the spores, and then we get infected. Um, what's another tough resistance stage, you guys, uh, that some bacteria can make? Yeah, awesome, you guys. Endosporin. So remember how we were talking about botulinum? Um, sorry, the endospores of Clostridium botulinum and the endospores of Clostridium tetani. What was a great reservoir? The dirt, right? Um, and again, you have that tough resistant endospore, right? So soil can be a reservoir for. Um, microbes that are either have, you know, tough and resistant themselves or have a tough resistant um, uh, structure. Oh, and another one, you guys, like naked viruses, like polio virus, right? Remember how the naked viruses are pretty resistant? And remember how we said polio virus shed in feces, since it's a naked virus, it's going to remain infectious for long periods of time. So wherever the uh, uh, feces goes, so if you have fecal contaminated water or food, right, and we ingest it, we can get it infected. So you can't think of feces in. Fecal contaminated environment is our reservoir. <coughs> okay, and then folks, um, once we have a reservoir, the microbe has to um, leave the reservoir and reach the new host. And what's that process called, you guys, when um, the pathogen leaves this reservoir and reaches the new host? What's that process called? Transmission, good. And you guys, I'm just going to use the slides, and I'll try to say, oh, I might ask you this or that, okay? So let me try to follow the slides. Um, so you guys, there's different types of transmission, and I definitely want you to know the difference between horizontal transmission and vertical transmission, okay? So the way I remember it, folks, is these directions. This is vertical. This is horizontal. Officially, vertical transmission is transmission of the pathogen from one generation, like from mom, to the next generation to baby. So that's what I always remember, you guys, vertical transmission, mom to baby. Now there's some other variations on that, but that's what I remember, it's mom to baby. Now why is vertical transmission of pathogens so devastating? Why do we really, really worry about vertical transmission? What do we know about a baby's immune system? Very, very underdeveloped, right? Um, and, and furthermore, you guys, what if, what if mom's pregnant and the pathogen crosses the placenta and invades the developing baby? Could that cause horrible developmental problems? Yeah, could even lead to the death of the baby or maybe per permanent, say, neurological damage, right? So we're really, really worried about, uh, or worried about all kinds of transmission, but very, very worried when we're talking about a baby in utero or a newborn baby, right? Because their immune system is just so not, not really strong yet. Yeah. And then, folks, what we'll do is, um, um, I think I've got more slides on vertical transmission. Um, so if vertical transmission is mom to baby, horizontal, you guys, in theory, it's like transmission within a generation. But to me, that breaks down. Because you guys, obviously, I'm not of your generation, right? I'm probably two generations older than you. But if I have, say, mycobacterium tuberculosis, I've got TB, and I'm up here coughing out mycobacterium tuberculosis, and you, you of a much younger generation, get infected, that's still considered horizontal. Okay, so it's a, to me it's a little bit confusing how they define it in the books. So to me, folks, when I think of anything that's not mom to baby, okay, anything that's not vertical is going to be horizontal. And, and I just wanted to share with you guys, and I, I know you get tired of my, my kind of dumb stories, but this was hilarious to me. So when I was in vet school, we, were, we had a course on in infectious diseases. And our instructor was this old, literally an old cowboy veterinarian. And you guys, my uncles are cowboys, so if, if I'm, I'm not trying to show disrespect, but because I, I, I got this from my uncles. So he comes in, he's got cowboy hat on, he's got his cowboy boots on, 
got his great big cowboy um, belt and buckle, right? Got a little bit of a bowed legs, probably because he was riding a horse before he could walk, right? And he had this great drawl. And my, my uncles from Colorado had this great drawl, so I think I can do this. So he came in, and he's talking about the basics of infectious diseases, right? And so we get to the part of transmission. And so he goes, now, place, we need to remember the acts of transmission. Fingers, food, feces, flies, fleas, fomites, and, and he stopped. Right? And I, I'm such a nerd, you guys. I'm like, if he, if he sneezes, I'm writing sneeze down. I'm writing, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting for him to say the next F. Right? And my classmates, who were much more sophisticated than I was, you know, they're kind of giggling a little bit, kind of chuckling. And I'm waiting for the last F, right? And so we get out, and my classmates tell me it's fornication. Okay. All right, you guys. Okay, so remember the Fs of transmission. Okay. So folks, what we're going to do, and, and I apologize, these slides aren't organized very well. Um, I think we've got some examples of pathogens transmitted vertically, and then we've got a few slides on um, horizontal transmission, okay? So folks, again, you don't have to memorize this, but again, just to give you an idea of the diversity of pathogens that can be transmitted um, vertically. And folks, so with vertical transmission, mom to baby, Again, we want to think about transplacental, right? If mom gets infected, the pathogen crosses the placenta and invades the baby. And folks, remember we talked about Listeria monocytogenes, right? The zoonotic pathogen that can be found in raw milk. And then if mom, gets, if mom consumes the raw milk product, she gets infected. The Listeria crosses the uh, placenta, affects the baby, can kill the baby outright, cause miscarriage, or if the baby survives, can cause neonatal sepsis and meningitis, right? So that was an example, right? Um, so we can have transplacental transfer, folks. Um, and these specifically, you guys can cross the placenta. So um, trepidema pallidum, which causes syphilis. Um, HIV, they think <coughs> can cross the placenta. I'm not sure if that's been proven yet, right? Uh, the German measles virus. And then a protozoal, a protozoal parasite, folks, um, um, that lives in the intestines of cats, Toxoplasma gondii. This is one reason they suggest that folks that are pregnant not clean um, a cat's litter box because the cats are a source of this Toxoplasma. It can cross the placenta and invade the baby and cause neurological problems like hydrocephaly. So that's why they're always telling pregnant women to be really careful around places that, where there might be cat feces. Yeah. And then folks, not only crossing the placenta, but what about um, a vaginal birth. I don't know if any of you, I know some of you have, have given birth and, and, um, and some of you have been um, witnesses to a vaginal birth, but my husband was saying that it's like a bloody battlefield. There's blood everywhere, right? So do you think that is an opportunity for a pathogen that's infecting mom, maybe bloodborne, to infect the baby? Yeah, so during the vaginal delivery, right, that's an opportunity. <laughs> And this is a heartbreak, you guys. Oh, this, I was just heartbreaking to hear this. It turns out that even breast milk can act as a source of pathogens for babies. And this is a heartbreak because we want moms to breastfeed, right? But in parts of the world where we have um, women that might be infected with HIV and they don't have access to good health care, um, they've, they've discovered that moms can pass infectious doses of HIV to their babies through the breast milk. And you guys, that, the, the chance of that ha happening goes way down if mom has access to good anti-HIV drugs, the heart therapy, right? Um, but again, not all folks have access to good health care. And again, in some parts of the world, you guys, if moms can't breastfeed, do you know how expensive formula is? And then you have to ask, and do they have clean water to mix with the formula, right? So... Um, you know, I, I would hope for all women that they could have, you know, um, if they have HIV, that they have good anti-HIV therapy. And then if they have children, that's going to reduce the chance of the baby getting infected at birth and also reduce the chance of the baby getting infected through breastfeeding. Yeah. And then, folks, another one that you guys have, have, have you know, really helped me think about. Remember how we were talking about with neonatal herpes? You know, we said we're worried if mom has genital herpes and if if she's, oh, wait, I should keep going, because there's actually a slide here, guys. Sorry, let me, let me stop. Okay, so 
Okay, some examples of vertical transmission in utero during delivery, breastfeeding, and examples, you guys, the congenital syphilis, toxoplasma, rubella, herpes virus, chlamydia, HIV, and hepatitis B. And I've got a couple more examples here, you guys. This is the treponema pallidum, a bacterium that causes syphilis. And again, this can cross the placenta and causes absolutely devastating effects, you guys, on the poor baby. And you guys, it's a bacterium. Can we kill it with antibiotics? Yes, we can. And this is heartbreaking, you guys, that there should be any babies born with congenital syphilis. It, it's a reflection that mom doesn't have access to good health care, right? <laughs> and, and folks, this was, this was, I pirated these slides, as you can tell. This, to me, was a good slide because talking about neonatal herpes. So remember, you guys, how we suggested that maybe the, the, the moms were really worried about, the pregnant moms were really worried about, are those that first get infected with genital herpes during pregnancy, right? And this was a slide, you guys, that, that helped me here. So our big concern is pregnant moms who first get infected with genital herpes late in pregnancy, like in the third trimester. Now, why does that make us more worried for the baby? In, in, in contrast to maybe a mom that's had genital herpes for many years and then she gets pregnant. And, and this, this is kind of unfair because we haven't had immunology yet, but um, moms who've been infected for a while, they're going to make antibodies against the herpes virus. And we're going to see you guys one class of antibodies, IgG antibodies. Mom can pass those protective antibodies across the placenta, transplacental transfer to the baby. So that whatever mom circulating anti IgG antibodies are, when the baby's born, the baby will be born with those same protective antibodies. But if mom has only recently got infected, you guys, does she have enough time to make the protective antibodies and, have, and transfer them to, no, she doesn't. So I think that's why, you guys, we're really worried about pregnant moms who get first infected with genital herpes late in pregnancy and who are shedding at the time of the vaginal delivery, right? So that, those babies are gonna be really high risk for infection and for spread. And we know it can spread throughout the body into the central nervous system, yeah? So, um, right, and based on your previous colleague's research, anti-herpes medication like acyclovir, your colleague said that they researched it and said it can be given to women that are pregnant. So again, you guys, it's just like being aware, you know, being aware, um, educating the, the parents, and then hopefully being able to treat with the antiviral drugs and maybe monitor for, shed, for shedding prior to delivery. And then this is, this is one, you guys, that has me really worried, Zika virus. Why do we worry about Zika virus in pregnant moms? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you guys, just, just because I think all, all young people should know this. So do you know three ways that humans get infected with Zika virus? Yes. Mosquitoes, right? And do we now have the 80s mosquitoes that are capable of transferring Zika here in Northern California? Yeah, we do. That is such bad news. Okay, mosquitoes. What else? Sexual transmission. Sexual transmission, you guys. This virus is crazy. So um, the, the, one of the first reports was a researcher from Colorado <coughs> University was doing studies in Africa. He got infected with Zika virus, came home. He was married. He had intercourse with his wife, and his wife got infected. No 80s mosquitoes, it was sexual transmission. And for many, a long time people were saying, you're crazy, but they've shown that now, right? So um, if a man gets infected and is intimate, he can transfer the Zika virus to his partner. Yeah. And you guys, why, why are we really worried about it? What's the third way? Transplacental transfer, right? So if mom's pregnant, then the virus crosses the placenta. And for some reason, you guys, the virus loves the baby's developing neurons invades them, right? And as a result, the, the nervous system of the baby doesn't develop properly. And in extreme cases, you guys, when the baby's born, what's gonna be unusual about their head? Really small, right? Because the brain hasn't developed fully, right? Um, and sadly, they've done studies where babies who are born to moms that got infected with Zika during pregnancy even in the babies that have a normal circumference of the head, suggesting the brain developed normally, when they do um, studies following up on the babies, 
a lot of those babies still have neurological problems, right? So, and this is where I do my, my soapbox. Okay, so Zika virus belongs to the same virus family as yellow fever virus, and we have a yellow fever uh, vaccine. And it's like, we need a Zika virus vaccine, right? Because this is devastating, devastating to these poor babies. Okay, so just examples, you guys. Uh, what kind of transfer is that? Mom to baby, what kind of transfer is that? Ver yeah, vertical, right, good, okay. And then you guys, with um, horizontal transmission, um, I mean, we could have a whole three, four hours on, on horizontal transmission. And the thing is, I don't want you guys to spend a lot of time on this. I think a lot of this is intuitive. But you guys, um, what, what we can do, is let me see if I've got a reference for you here in your little in the handout. So you guys, on page three, um, um, on transmission, right? There's vertical, and then and then we, the rest of this, you guys. Sorry, two, three, and four. I should have labeled that as horizontal. Okay. <clears throat> so you guys, let me just see if I can point out to you what I'd like you to know for the um, lecture exam three. Okay. So you guys, so with horizontal, there's three basic groups of transmission contact vehicle and vector transmission. Let's do the easiest first. So you guys know about vector transmission, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Arthropod vectors. And folks, I wouldn't ask this on the exam, but you might see when people are talking about arthropod vectors, two different types, mechanical arthropod vectors and biological vectors. So mechanical vectors are, uh, uh, mechanical arthropod vectors are arthropods like flies and cockroaches who become contaminated on the outside of their bodies with a pathogen, and usually it's from walking on what? Feces. Feces, right? So like, let's say you're out in a picnic, you know, and you're by a cow pasture, and the flies are flying and stepping all over the cow feces, and then they fly over and walk on your potato salad, right? So they're just passively transferring the pathogen to your food. And the same thing, you guys, with cockroaches, I didn't realize this, but cockroaches are notorious for um, being what we call mechanical vectors. And indeed, you guys, I think it was last semester, we were in lab and a person shrieked because this cockroach little head was poking out of the, the gas outlets. I mean, it's like, oh my God, you know? So anyway, we captured the cockroach and put it on an auger plate and just left it overnight. And then we incubated, we, and then we, we put the cockroach outside and then we incubated the plate. And it was phenomenal, you guys. The next day <clears throat> after incubation, you could see exactly where the cockroach had walked and what, what, was, what was in the cockroach footprints. The, yeah, all the bacteria colonies. Like, wow, that was a powerful demonstration of a mechanical <laughs> vector, right? So if the cockroaches were crawling over feces, um, and it could be animal feces, like mouse or rat feces, you know, whatever, and then they come and they walk on your food, that's a great way to transfer pathogens. Biological vectors, you guys, is what we studied in lab. So biological vectors are um, arthropod vectors in which the pathogen either grows and replicates or undergoes some kind of development. So the vector actually becomes important um, in the replication or development of the pathogen. And some examples, you guys, like um, um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is tick-borne, um, which disease does Borrelia burgdorferi cause here in California? Lyme, Lyme disease. disease, good. Um, fleas and, if, if I say fleas in California, what do you think of? Bubonic plague, good, good, you guys. Um, let me see here, what else could we do? Um, uh, the trypanosomes, trypanosoma cruciae, tr trypanosoma brucei, just some examples, where the arthropod is the biological vector the pathogens either replicate and or undergo um, development within the pathogen. Yeah, so those guys you're probably familiar with. And you guys are gonna, we're, we're kind of going from the bottom up. Vehicle transmission, you guys, is like airborne. So remember the coccidioides imminus, the fungal spores, right? The air can blow them from uh, 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 many, many miles, right? We can inhale them. Waterborne, you guys, again, my, I'm always focused on feces, but I think of fecal contaminated streams, um, uh, drinking water, swimming pools. Um, foodborne, again, I think of feces, you know, fecal contamination of food. But also, if you guys like seafood, um, some um, <coughs> seafood can become contaminated with, for example, Vibrio cholera, the pathogen that causes cholera. Um, I, and, and, and foodborne, I also think, you guys, of, um, like beef. 
um, B from a BSE infected um, cow or steer, right? So the beef and the food becomes the source of the pathogens. Yeah. Can you explain biological transmission? Oh, okay. So biological means that the pathogen replicates inside of the vector or undergoes some type of um, development inside the vector. Yeah. So on uh, mechanical, it's just like in mechanical, maybe an easier way to say mechanical, in mechanical, the vector isn't ingesting the pathogen. Um, in a mechanical vector, the, the pathogen is just on the outside. It's like if you had muddy boots, right, and there were, or, or poopy boots, right, and you had pathogens there and you walk into a room and contaminate it, right, you'd be kind of like a mechanical vector. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't the insects die from the pathogens they spread? Oh, that's a really good point. It depends on the vector. So, for example, you guys, and you're going to love this, um, like with the fleas and bubonic plague, um, I might have told you this already, but it's so delicious, I have to tell you again. So what happens is when the fleas feed, say, on a rodent that has your Yersinia pestis in the bloodstream, so the fleas are sucking up the blood, and what happens, your Yersinia pestis, the bacteria, they start replicating in the, like the, the gut of the flea, forming a blockage. And because of that blockage of the Yersinia pestis, so they replicated to high numbers, the flea tries to feed again, like sucking up blood, but it's got this blockage, right? And so what does the flea do? The flea vomits into the bite wound. And that's how the Yersinia pestis gets into our bite wounds by vomiting it up. So that flea will die eventually, but it lives long enough to transmit the pathogen. Then there's other pathogens, and I think, I'm sorry guys, I go off on this, that have co-evolved with their vectors for such a long time, like with malaria, plasmodium, and often it's mosquitoes, they co-evolve with mosquitoes for so long. As far as I know, the plasmodium doesn't shorten the life of the Anopheles mosquitoes. Yeah, so in some cases, eventually, the pathogen will kill the vector, but not before the vector has done what? Passed it on to a new host, right? And that's all the pathogen cares about, right? Yeah, good questions, you guys. All right, and then folks, contact transmission. Um, contact transmission. Um, direct and indirect. So, so folks, how should this here? Would be a great example of this. Um, let's say, um, oh, influenza. Let's do influenza, you guys. Okay, so influenza envelope RNA virus, right? Since its envelope, is it going to remain infectious um, once it's out of the host and it dries up? No, right? So, usually with influenza, you guys, how? If I have influenza right now, do I have to usually be pretty close to you? And sneezing and coughing in your face, right? Because this is a delicate little envelope virus that can't remain in the environment very long, right? So we could say that's contact. And I think they say within three feet, you guys will have coughing and sneezing. Or you guys, what if I, I'm like, ah, phew, ah, right? And then, oh, Jessica, let me shake your hand, right? And then you get contaminated, you wipe your eyes or whatever, right? Um, the perfect thing of, of contact, you guys, is uh, sexual contact. And if you think about it, folks, the pathogens that are sexually transmitted, these are wussy pathogens, meaning they're not very um, resistant, right? Think about HIV. If it gets shed in the environment, envelope virus, it dries up, it's no longer infectious. Therefore, it needs intimate close contact through the exchange of bodily fluids, right, for it to be able to invade another one. Perfect example of contact, right? So sexual, um, sexual contact, bites, you know, animals that bite, right? Um, handshakes, you know, coming into physical contact with another infected um, host, and during that physical contact, the pathogen is transferred. Think of that as contact, right? In, co in contrast, folks, indirect transmission is when the original infected host is no longer present. And I'm, like I was just thinking, you guys, a good example might be, let's say you're working in a hospital, and you have a room in which a patient has Clostridium difficile diarrhea, C. diff diarrhea, right? And they've shown that in those patients' rooms, the floor is contaminated with the C. diff endospores, right? So let's say that patient, eventually maybe they get better, and you send them home, but what, what remains behind in, the, in the, the C. diff endospores, right? And now you bring in a brand new patient, maybe a surgical patient, right? and you have them stay in that room, and then they ingest the endospores, right, and they get infected. 
So in that case, you guys, was the infected host present when the pathogen was transferred to the new host? No, no. so we would call that indirect, right? Probably a better example, you guys, of indirect is uh, what we call fomites, and that might be a vocabulary term you see on the exam. So you guys, fomites are inanimate objects that get contaminated with pathogens, and then when a new host comes along and uses that contaminated fomite, then the new host gets contaminated, right? So again, indirect, the original infected host is not physically present, so the pathogen is transferred to a new host. And I think, you guys, let me, let me, uh, um, I think I've got a slide on this. So you guys, so for indirect, like, contaminated drinking glasses, toothbrushes, toys, um, punctures, I think of like a nail. You guys remember the classroom tetani endospores on a nail? When you step on the nail, well, the nail becomes the fomite, right? Um, droplets from sneezing and coughing within, within, within one meter, right? We slap it. Okay, let me see what we've got for you guys. So fomites, um, probably an example, you guys, uh, of really serious fomites would be folks that are using unsterile um, hypodermic syringes and needles, you know, folks that are doing IV drugs and don't have access to clean needles. And we know that not only can those needles and syringes, those fomites be contaminated with bloodborne pathogens like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Remember you guys when we were talking about wound botulism and tetanus, right? And we were saying, you know, watch out for the members of our community that are IV drug users and don't have access to clean needles and syringes because what are they at risk of suffering from? Literally using, literally using dirty needles. The wound botulism, right, and tetanus, right? Yeah. So... Um, that would be another soapbox for me to go off on, but anyway, it would sure help if everybody had access to clean needles and syringes, but that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay. Um, and historically, you guys, there have been horror stories of fomites like blankets that were used by smallpox victims being gifted to the indigenous people of North America. Um, transmitted smallpox wiped out so many of our um, indigenous um, peoples, yeah. Ah, okay, so fomites, you guys, what is what is a fomite? Inanimate object. Awesome. Inanimate object contaminated with pathogens, right? And so the fomite, when it's used by a new host, the pathogen is transferred to the new host. Yeah. Good. Good job, you guys. Okay, and this arthropod vectors, you guys, again, you don't have to memorize this. It was just giving you examples, and we've had those labs on the arthropod vectors, so I think you guys are pretty, pretty confident with those. And folks, this healthcare-associated infection, I did throw one question on lecture exam three on these healthcare-associated infections, HAIs. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the old days, you guys, we would call them nosocomial infections, me meaning hospital-acquired. But now um, they've kind of broadened the term to healthcare-associated infections because there's so many healthcare settings where we could become infected with a pathogen through some procedure. Um, so it would include dental offices, doctor's offices, any place where you could pick up a pathogen that you didn't come into the office with. So and then folks for these healthcare associated infections, what I would do on the lecture exam is ask you which factors contribute to these healthcare associated infections. Why are we so worried about them? So you guys on page two uh, about halfway down, it says in bold, what are factors contributing to um, HAIs? So, um, and, and again, you guys, it's kind of like the perfect storm. So let's presume it's a hospital. And you guys, why, why are your patients in the hospital? <coughs> They're sick, right? They're hurt, right? They have injuries, maybe broken skin, mucous membranes. Um, they could be in there for surgery, right? And again, you guys, we're going to break the skin, you know, our primary defense. So remember the your host population in the hospital, right, they're at higher risk. They're, usually their normal defenses are lowered, right? So they're the perfect host for opportunistic pathogens. And then furthermore, you guys, what do you do in healthcare settings? What do you do in hospitals? What do you do in a dental clinic? Are you using lots of inanimate objects on your patients? Mm -hmm. Inserting, poking, prodding, puncturing, cutting, right? 
So we have all these wonderful fomites that can get contaminated with pathogens and get introduced into areas they, sh they shouldn't be, right? And they can start growing. And then, folks, chain of, um, uh, chain of transmission. So it's like if, if you as a healthcare provider, you guys, if you're working with your patients, when you move from one patient to another, what do you want to make sure you do? Wash your hands, right? Because if you don't, what could you do? Tran transfer a pathogen from your infected patient to a new patient, right? So you become part of the chain of transmission. And you guys working in medical settings, are you a lot of times like running around like crazy trying to go from one person to the next? Don't have time to think, let alone maybe wash your hands or something like that. So that's a huge issue, right, in the healthcare, um, healthcare environment. And then, folks, again, what about your patients? What about your C. diff patient? Are they shedding endospores, right? Uh, what, if I'm in, what if I'm in the hospital with active TB? <laughs> right? You know, the pathogens that are suffering, the pathogens. The patients that are suffering with um, infectious disease, they're a rich source, a reservoir of pathogens for the other patients, right? So no wonder we have such concerns over the healthcare-associated infections. And you guys, in a hospital, like if you go in for one procedure and you end up getting infected, say, with a bacterium, what, what's our great concern about bacteria that you pick up at a healthcare facility? Antibiotic resistance, right? Because there's a good chance those bacteria have, have been living in this environment saturated with antibiotics. Um, so often those bacteria are antibiotic resistant. And, oh, and you guys, that's the other bad news. Remember how I said I carry staph aureus in my nose? Man, I mean, I, I mean, if I was, say, a nurse, I don't think I should be taking care of burn patients. I'm not sure I should be taking care of surgical patients, right? Because I then become, I'm colonized, and then I become a reservoir, right, of transmission of this path. Anyway, it's good I'm not a nurse, you guys. Okay. All right. <coughs> and, and this, you guys, this is just a, a, a really kind of, a, it's called a Venn diagram of the factors contributing to those healthcare associated. They use a Venn diagram when there's multiple factors involved. And when all the factors are just right, you end up with those nosocomial infections, those hospital acquired, or healthcare associated infections. And do remember, you guys, some old advice would tell us how could we save people's lives? Washing your hands, yeah. Uh, so folks, um, this is just some little tidbits here. Um, epidemiology is a study of epidemics, how infectious diseases spread through populations of organisms. And there's historically a person who's called the um, father of epidemiology. This was a physician by the name of John Snow who lived in London um, during, I think it was the 1800s. <clears throat> and London would go through these epidemics of cholera. And um, cholera is caused by the bacterium Vibro cholera causes a watery, profuse diarrhea. And you can die from dehydration, right? It's that bad. And back in John Snow's day, they didn't know what caused cholera, right? So he was trying to figure out in, in these neighborhoods in London why one neighborhood was having lots of cholera cases and then maybe other surrounding neighborhoods, there weren't that many cases. He's trying to figure out what's going on here. So he took a map that had the little buildings at each street address, and he used a little X to indicate where the cholera cases were occurring. So he looked at his map, you know, and there'd be a concentration of cholera cases in this neighborhood. He's like, so what's different about this neighborhood with high cholera cases and the surrounding neighborhoods that don't have a lot of cholera? And he came up with this educated guess, you guys. He said, well, everybody in this neighborhood uses water from what was called the Broad Street Pump. So back in the day, especially with the poor folks, they didn't have indoor plumbing. So there'd be a pump that would serve a neighborhood. So you go and go, right, and get your bucket of water and take it back to your home. So Jon Snow didn't know what caused cholera, but he thought it had something to do with the water from the Broad Street pump. So he did this famous experiment. He, took the, he had the, the city officials take the handle off the Broad Street pump so nobody could get water from there anymore. They had to go to the pumps that um, supplied the surrounding neighborhoods. And guess what happened? The number of cholera cases went way down, right? So even though you guys, they didn't know it was causing cholera, Snow figured out transmission had something to do with the water from that pump. And as it turns out, as you guys probably know, um, cholera is fecal oral transmission. 
So people that have cholera are shedding massive amount of vibrio cholera in their feces, and if it gets into drinking water, right, and somebody drinks it, then they get cholera. So um, my understanding is the water for the Broad Street pump, it was drawing water from the river downstream from where sewage was being dumped in, right? Because I don't think back then they quite understood fecal oral transmission. So the sewage that had the um, diarrhea from the cholera victims was being dumped upstream, floating down, and then the water that was being drawn into the Broad Street pump was being taken from that water, so chock full of the cholera bacteria. Apparently, the pumps for the other neighborhood, they were drawing water upstream for the sewage was being dumped in, right? So, so again, you guys, even though Jon Snow didn't know it was a bacterium, he knew it had to do with water, and by stopping access to that contaminated water, he was able to stop the cholera outbreak. And that's what epidemiology is all about, trying to figure out reservoirs, transmission, um, um, trying in, in, in knowing the reservoir and transmission, you might be able to interrupt the transmission right of the pathogen and then thus stop an outbreak. Yeah. So he is called the father of epidemiology. He's not the Game of Thrones Johnson. Okay. <laughs> and you guys, we already did EIDs. What are EIDs? Emerging infectious diseases, and we think most of them in the future will be what? Zoonoses. Yeah. Good job, you guys. Right. Okay, that is that, you guys. So, folks, I know that was really fast, but do you have any questions on that, that this last little part on, on um, reservoirs and transmission? It's not as dense as the virulence factors one. That's why I wanted to do virulence factors first and do this second, right? Okay. All right, you guys. So what we're going to do in the next, like, 20 minutes is we're going to introduce the last unit of the course. And the last unit of the course, you guys, is on host defenses or immunity. And I think immunity comes from the root for protection. And certainly, you guys, um, whenever we do that airborne microbe experiment in lab and I look at the plates, I'm like, are you kidding? We're, every time we inhale, we're bringing in all these microbes. You know, and then you see them growing, you're like, why, are, why aren't we all dead? You know, like all those microbes we're inhaling. Um, so it is amazing, you guys, that we are as healthy as, as we are, right? We're living in this world of microbes. You know, there was maybe 10 microbes for every human cell in our body. So we could argue after studying the pathogens and understanding opportunistic pathogens, I think it's amazing that we are as healthy as we are, you know, that we aren't constantly infected by pathogens. So this last part of the course, then, you guys, we want to take a look at um, the strategies that um, humans have evolved to pr protect ourselves from invading pathogens, right? So we want to remember, you guys, that humans have been co-evolving with microbes for forever, you know. Um, even before we had evolved into humans, we were co-evolving with microbes. So there's been um, natural selection, right? So the environment selects those genetic variants that are best adapted to survive in a world of microbes. So what we're going to do, you guys, this will be so superficial. Um, I'm so glad you guys have either had AMP or will have AMP because they do an amazing job with immunology. This will be really superficial, so I hope it won't be disappointing to you. Okay? Because um, truly immunology deserves a course of its own. Okay, so we're just going to do kind of superficial, give you a little appetizers. Okay, so, um, right, so we're going to call this innate nonspecific host defenses or immunity. Right? And we're trying to answer the questions of microbes are everywhere. Why aren't we constantly infected, being harmed by microorganisms? So again, you guys, we, we're, um, we, we know that we've co-evolved with these microbes. So there's been natural selection for um, strategies to protect ourselves from these pathogens. And um, very often, you guys, um, we think of like two, like how should I say, historically, um, immunology was thought of kind of as warfare. So a lot of military terms were used. It was like us against the microbes. And, you know, the microbes are the enemies. And so often there's a lot of mil military terminology that's used. So indeed, you guys, we could break down um, host defenses immunology into two major branch branches. One branch is called innate nonspecific immunity. That's the topic of this PowerPoint. 
And this is um, strategies that are always on, right? They're always on, and they protect us against a wide range of microbes. So that's why it's called nonspecific innate. We're born with it. They're always on, always ready to go. So it's the first layer of protection against invading microbes, right? Um, and then, you guys, the second branch is called, it's changed its name so many times, Acquired Adaptive Specific Immunity. This is like the real powerhouse of the immune system. Um, this is where we're going to talk about like antibodies, immunoglobulins being produced. We'll talk about cell-mediated immunity, right? The really big guns of our immune system. But, you guys, there's a big disadvantage. Um, for us to trigger, to get our big guns into position, it usually takes 10 to 14 days. It's relatively slow, right? So we rely on those innate defenses to protect us while our adaptive acquired big guns are getting activated, yeah? Okay, so, so we're going to start out with innate defenses, our first lines of defense. And you guys, <clears throat> because I, the only way I can learn science is to make stories, so I was trying to you know, take the immune system and break it down into a story. And this just shows you guys how old I am. I use Lord of the Rings. I should have been using Game of Thrones, but you guys, you know, just didn't quite get those books finished in time. So I was thinking, okay, how is Lord of the Rings kind of like the immune system? So, so this is kind of goofy, you guys, but I think of it like it's a castle. The immune system are the layers of defenses of a castle. And, and forgive me for being so goofy about this. Okay, so like in my mind, it's like okay, here, here you are, here you are, right here, right, here you are, and you're being attacked by the orc pathogens, right? So here are the microbial pathogens are attacking. They want to invade you and cause harm. I don't know how to make an orc, but pretend those are the orcs attacking, okay? So the orcs are attacking, right? And so we're going to retreat into our castle, our lines of defenses, because, you know, it's like these guys are really strong and scary. We don't really have enough uh, defenses together. So I think of our, our um, we could call it castle defense, like is three layers of defenses. So the outermost walls, you guys, the outermost layers, we'll call those the... Um, <coughs> exterior or surface uh, nonspecific defenses. And these are truly like our, our physical barriers. So you guys, what's the most, one of our most important physical barriers? Skin. Our skin, right? And what about, what about, uh, 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 mucous membranes, right, okay? So those are our surface defenses. They're always in contact with cells from the outside world, right? It's almost like they're, like, um, if you talk about mucous membranes, um, like the gastrointestinal tract, the urinary tract, it's almost like invasions of the outside world into our body, right? So we have to have those mucous membranes as part of our defenses. But we know, you guys, that, like, in the movie, you know, the orcs blew up the outer wall, right? So we know that microbes can penetrate through the skin and mucous membranes. So then, you guys, we're going to have these interior nonspecific defenses. And maybe this is, I don't know, the first line of soldiers maybe inside. And what we're going to, um, what we're going to do, you guys, is we're going to talk about inflammation. We're going to talk about phagocytosis. So maybe the phagocytes are our soldiers, right, that are trying to kill the invaders. We're going to talk about fever. We're going to talk about um, complement activation. And we're going to talk about interferons. And again, you guys, this is all non-specific defenses, always ready to go, right? But in the Lord of the Rings, you guys, did, did they start to break through? Like, they were almost, you know, they penetrated, they're almost going to get to, to you, right? And they're going to kill you, right? But the non-specific defenses held off the enemy, held off the enemy until... Do, 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 do. I don't know if there was a trumpet or not, you guys. But what happened was then um, there was enough time. So then the acquired, acquired adaptive specific immune responses. Had enough time to be activated. And you guys, we're going to talk about humoral immunity. 
and this is the uh, protection provided by antibodies or immunoglobulins and cell mediated immunity and so it's like well what what do these represent in our great battle there so maybe these were so oops, sorry cell mediated immunity I just love that you know it looked like everybody was gonna die and here comes who <coughs> Gandalf arrives cell mediated immunity so maybe these are these are the extra um, forces that arrive when Gandalf arrives, you know, and the sun comes up over the hill, and everybody's going to be safe. So now, the sad thing is, you guys will probably only have one lecture on adaptive uh, immunity, so it'll be very superficial. But that's all right. We can we can still we can still get to the good stuff. So so folks, this first PowerPoint then is dealing with. Um, uh, exterior surface nonspecific defenses and then interior nonspecific defenses. And I'm guessing you guys will probably only have time to hit the um, surface defenses, right? And then hopefully Thursday you guys will blast through this portion and then we'll have our lecture exam three and then you guys will have one lecture on acquired adaptive um, immunity. Whew, that's going to be fun. It will be fun. It's amazing. All right, guys, so these innate defenses just kind of in general. <laughs> Um, the good thing is it's fast, right? There's no lag time, right? All eukaryotes have it. It can, if we're lucky, um, in, in some cases we can kill the invaders. Um, and again, guys, it's effective against a wide, broad range of microbes. It's not specific. Um, it's not tailored to one specific microbe. But you guys, this is the, <clears throat> this is the disadvantage, right? This is the disadvantage here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those non-specific innate defenses um, they don't demonstrate what we call immunological memory, meaning um, if I get infected with a pathogen today and a year later I get reinfected with the same pathogen, I will have the same innate nonspecific uh, response. It's not going to be stronger, it's not going to be better, it's going to be the same response as the first time I got infected. So there's no memory, right? And that's a huge disadvantage of these innate um, response. So you guys, let's just see how far we can get. Oh, well, before before I forget you guys, because we're going to hit like um, skin and mucous membranes. One thing I forgot to tell the Monday class, part of those innate uh, nonspecific surface defenses, you guys, are the good members of the normal microbiome. So we never want to forget about them. They are part of our surface defenses. They're protecting us against many opportunistic pathogens. So we always want to respect them and take good care of them. So you guys, since we're starting to run out of time, let's take a quick peek, you guys, at skin as part of our surface defenses. So, so skin, you guys, it's a physical barrier. Uh, the, in the lower layers, the cells are tightly adherent to one another to, to form a physical barrier so the microbes can't penetrate deeper. That's why when we get injured or we have surgery right, it's a great way for the microbes to enter. Um, healthy skin, you guys, it should be dry, and the reason that's good is that a lot of microbes need water, right? So if, if our skin's dry, that will inhibit the growth of some microbes. Um, if we take the pH, you guys, the skin is rather acidic. I think somewhere, somewhere in like 5, 5.2, something like that. So, and we know that acidic pH will inhibit the growth of some microbes. The normal microbiota, just as we mentioned, you guys, part of our defenses, um, if we licked our skin, it would taste salty because of sweat. Now, can salt inhibit the growth of microbes? Yeah, it can. And furthermore, you guys, we make lysozyme. Lysozyme um, hydrolyzes the glycosidic bond between NAG and NAM and peptidoglycan, right? Um, we make fatty acids, which will inhibit the growth of many microbes. And you guys, the cool thing is, is like if you gently scrape the top surface of your cell, you see those little flakes? And you guys, in a &P, what are the names of those little flakes coming off? Stratified squamous keratinized epithelial cells, right? They're dead cells, right? Chock full of this really strong um, protein called keratin that very few microbes can digest. So you guys, those sloughing cells, that's a great defense. If a microbe sticks, probably within 24 hours, that, that cell to which the microbe um, is stuck to is going to fall off, physically removing them. So this sloughing of the cells is great protection. I, and this, excuse me, you guys, <clears throat> this is a um, section through skin. It's been stained. We're looking at it with a light microscope. And you can just see that dead layer of keratinized um, cells up here, folks. But this represents a hair follicle. And you guys like with me, I'm hairy everywhere. I've just got hairs everywhere. 
Um, and the reason I wanted to show that to you is that Staph aureus, Staph aureus, you guys, loves to grow down the hair follicle and grow down here at the bottom, right? And this is why very often when you have little abscesses, often the abscess, um, it started out as a Staph aureus growing in the hair follicle there. So that's a way that Staph aureus can get deeper into our, our tissue. <coughs> So folks with um, mucous membranes, mucous membranes, it's a little bit harder because many mucous membranes, for example, in the intestine, part of their job is to absorb things. So we can't have thick layers of these keratinized cells. That would, that would stop absorption. And furthermore, you guys, we can't really be dry, right? The mucous membranes need to remain moist. So <coughs> mucous membranes, folks, are really cool in that there are cells called goblet cells, I believe, that, that secrete this thick mu mucus blanket over the surface of the mucous membranes. <coughs> and I think of that mucus blanket as a microbial flypaper. One of its job is to trap microbes in this sticky flypaper, and then one way or the other, this, the cell, the, excuse me, um, will try to move that sticky um, mucus blanket out of our body, and with it, the entrapped microbes will be taken out as well. Um, in the, the mucus, um, uh, 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 the mucus layers, you guys, excuse me, uh, the mucus membrane cells will slough off, right? Again, um, we've got normal microbiota, um, microbiome that's, that's also protecting us. We have lysozyme. And you guys, what I just want to end, end with is a quick race through talking about ciliated cells in the respiratory tract and the oviducts and, and how important those ciliated cells are and why they're an important part of our surface defenses. So you guys... So these beautiful ciliated cells in the mucous membrane, they have these extensions, these cilia, and they beat together. And one of their jobs, for example, in the upper respiratory tract, in the trachea, is one of their jobs is to beat together to move that sticky microbial flypaper, the mucus blanket, up to the back of the throat. So remember, the microbes, all that stuff we're breathing in, we're hoping it's stuck there. So the ciliated cells move the blanket to the back of the throat where we can either spit it out to physically remove the microbes, or what else could we do? We could swallow it, right, and kill those guys in, like, the pH 2 of the stomach, yeah? So, you guys, in the old days, they called that combination of the ciliated cells and the mucus blanket, they called it the mucociliary escalator, and it's crucial for protection of the lower respiratory tract from pathogens, yeah? But, you guys, we know that if, say, for example, we're chronic smokers or maybe we're, maybe we're firefighters and we're exposed to lots of smoke, smoke can damage those ciliated cells. So with long-term exposure, the ciliated cells are damaged. Your goblet cells are still making mucus, but now we can't move that mucus blanket to the back of our throat. So if we inhale a pathogen, it might get stuck there in the mucus blanket, but it can start growing there and grow downward into the lower respiratory tract, right? So this is why folks that are, have been long-term smokers, often they suffer from recurrent, like maybe bacterial pneumonia, yeah? And, and another thing you guys connected to our discussion of influenza, influenza virus likes to replicate in cells of the upper respiratory tract. So following recovery from influenza, your mucociliary muc escalator is not working properly, and that's why folks that recover from influenza often end up with secondary bacterial pneumonia, right? Because of the damage done to the mucociliary escalator. Yeah. Okay. Oh, isn't that gorgeous, you guys? The ciliated cell. Oh, your bodies are just amazing. And then, you guys, just in two minutes, another place that we have ciliated cells is in the female reproductive tract, and the oviducts are fallopian tubes. And their job is twofold. One is for immunology, or, excuse me, for surface defenses. Um, those ciliated cells, you guys, and the blue tubes are over that. They're going to be to um, move the mucus blanket down towards the uterus where any pathogens will be then um, removed through exit through the, um, the cervix and, and the vagina. But also, you guys, those ciliated cells are so important when a woman is ovulating, when she releases an egg. Human eggs don't have cilia or flagella. They're non-modal. They're just like, now what do I do, right? And we know, folks, that when the, the egg, the ovum, is released from the ovary, it has to make its way through the fallopian tubes, the ovidex, to the uterus, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the second function of the ciliated cells. They create um, currents um, that passively draw the egg through the ovidex into the uterus. Well, you're like, well, you know, who cares? The problem is, folks, if we have... Um, uh, sexually transmitted infections, 
with Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia, these are two bacterial pathogens. We can kill them with antibiotics, you guys, if we know we're infected, right? But if women experience long-term chronic infections with those, one or the other, or both of those pathogens, they cause damage to the ciliated cells in the ovidex. So, so what could happen, folks, is that when a woman ovulates, maybe the egg travels maybe halfway through the oviduct, and then because all the ciliated cells are damaged, it can't go any further, right? And what if the woman is inseminated? What do, what do human sperm have? Flagella. You see those videos, you guys, how fast? So all the sperm are racing, trying to find the egg, right? And if they find the egg stuck in the oviduct, will they still fertilize? Yeah. yeah. So what kind of pregnancy then does the, the woman experience? Ectopic pregnancy. And you guys, the fertilized egg, the embryo is not going to make it. And that can also be life-threatening for the mom, right, if the oviduct ruptures, right? So that's a bad consequence, you guys, of chronic infections with Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia. And then furthermore, you guys, um, it ends up the woman can end up with pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, an infection of the uterus, oviducts, and you guys, to me, it seems to me like that infection could extend out into the peritoneal cavity, and often those are very serious infections. They sometimes require hospitalization with hardcore IV drugs, yeah? And, and, and in some cases, folks, if the damage is, you know, long, long term, the woman might eventually um, not be able to conceive, right? Um, so that can be a big heartbreak too. So this is why you guys, we, men and women, right, we want to make sure that especially if you're sexually active, that you're getting those checkups, right, to make sure if you're infected with Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia, give you the antibiotics and, you know, clear it up, and, and we won't have any of those long-term consequences. Okay, so you guys, thanks so much. I'll see part of you at 1. And you guys, what we'll do on Thursday is we'll try to get through the interior non-specific defenses. Okay? So you guys, take good care.